Hey y'all, welcome back for another episode of MD Tribe. This week we have Dr. Annie Grother, who is an amazing woman I had the opportunity to connect with through Instagram. She does fitness, she does medicine, she does some influencing. She's just a phenomenal woman. She graduated from UM and she also tells us about her experience in applying to residency, her experience in deciding to choose medicine as a career and her experience as a resident for physical medicine and rehabilitation. So I'm really excited for y'all to see everything that she has to say. She shares all of her challenges and the obstacles she overcame. She shares about her recognitions as Forbes 30 Under 30 nominee. And I'm just very excited for y'all to hear directly from the source who is the amazing Dr. Grother. So without further ado, here's another episode of MD Tribe. So this week we have Dr. Annette Grother. She is a first year resident um, for physical medicine and rehabilitation. She is a graduate of the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine, and she is the founder of Shop Docs, which she was recognized as a Forbes 30 Under 30 honoree. So I'm really excited to interview her today. So without further ado, can you give us a little bit of background about yourself? Yeah, hi guys. Um, my name is Dr. Grother. I go I go by Annie. Um, and I, you know, I was born abroad. I was actually born in West Africa and Liberia and kind of have like this circuitous story how I ended up in the US, but I grew up in Colorado, uh, went to CU Boulder. So if any buffs are out there, uh, you know, go buffs, go buffs. <laughs> and I ended up, you know, traveling around a little bit after undergrad, having a couple of different jobs and kind of exploring before realizing that I wanted to go to medical school. And then I ended up applying, going to Miami, and I've been in South Florida ever since. So um, that's kind of a little bit of my, my background, my story. Um, yeah, let me know if there's anything else that you would want to know. Okay, so you mentioned, you mentioned you're from uh, Liberia, right? Mm -hmm. What initially brought you to the United States, if you don't mind me asking? <laughs> yeah, so um, they, there was actually a really bad civil war that started um, the year that I was born. So I was actually lucky enough that my dad was able to bring me back to the U.S. Um, and I, you know, my mother stayed there actually during the war and I didn't get to meet her until I was 19. So my first time out of the U.S. and my first time, um, you know, seeing my mom and first time in a third world country all happened to be in the same trip. And so it was definitely a very momentous um, experience being able to go back and meet her for the first time, like as a full grown adult when I left, you know, at one wow. year old. So, yeah. Wow, that is very insane. Yeah, yeah it's kind of crazy. But <laughs> yeah. And so you went um, to Colorado for school, correct? Yeah, so I went to CU Boulder. I actually was a psych major, um, and I didn't know. I wasn't, like, pre-med or anything. I just was living life, um, studying, you know. <laughs> I got good grades, but, you know, psych is definitely a different beast than pre-med. So I kind of enjoyed my time. I did a lot of research in undergrad, which was um, good in preparation for me applying to medical school because I already had all this experience, some publications, posters, and stuff like that from, from undergrad. Um, but yeah, I graduated from U Boulder and I actually ended up doing a post back there also when I finally realized I wanted to go to medical school and I went back to see you and did a year post back um, in order to get my prereqs for medical school taken care of. Gotcha. And what, did you have a specific moment where you realized like, oh, I'm, I want to become a doctor or how did that play out? Yeah, I mean, I was always interested in health in general. For example, like when I graduated, I did a, a research fellowship. I was doing like epidemiology. You know, I, I wanted to impact people in a positive way and I wanted to like leave a mark on the world. And um, I thought that was going to be through research. And like I, I went to Boston and I was working with all these really cool physicians who were um, they had an MPH and then they were also um, doing their MD. And 
they were just doing the coolest stuff. They, they got to do the research aspect, but they also got to sit down with people. Um, they were educating them. They were like motivating them. They were um, connecting them with resources. And there's this one physician and she, I, I think I've told her before, but um, Dr. Marcel, um, I, would, I shared like a pod with her and I would always overhear her conversations with her patients you know, she was always trying to um, get them enrolled in experimental trials so they could get free drugs, or she was just, like, the the coolest, the nicest, and then, like, had this really amazing connection and really served her patients in a, a very powerful way, and I think that's when I started to wonder, like, hey, like, she's so cool. I didn't know doctors were so cool. Hey, like, she's doing all this. <laughs> yeah, like, I thought they were all super nerdy. Um, she's doing all this really cool work, and that's, I could see myself doing that, and so that was kind of, like, the first time it clicked for me. And I started, I mean, I was lucky that I had this opportunity. I was in this, um, I was at Tufts, you know, they have amazing resources. I got to shadow a ton of physicians there, um, and ended up applying for my post back, like, probably a couple months later. Wow. Do you think if you hadn't done that research experience, you would have found out that you were called to medicine or no? I think about that a lot. Um, I honestly don't know if I, because, because Colorado, like, you know, the people I went to school with are more laid back, I guess, like going to the East Coast, everyone is very career oriented, very uh, achievement oriented. And that's not how I grew up necessarily. Um, so I, I don't think if I hadn't left Colorado and tried something new and seen different perspectives that I would have um, branched out and tried the, the medical path, to be honest. But you never know, like, maybe it's your, if it's your calling. <laughs> maybe, there, maybe at age 40, I would have realized that I wanted to go to medical yeah. school and I would be even older. <laughs> well, that's kind of great to hear because I feel like in my previous interviews, a lot of the physicians that I've interviewed, they're like, I knew since I was four. I knew since I was five. And I was like, I don't even remember when I was four. Like, yeah. <laughs> so it's nice to to hear somebody that figured it out later on, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, don't, I think like when I was four, I wanted to have 1,000 horses and marry Superman. So I, I really like, I don't know. <laughs> and now we're here. <laughs> yeah. So what was your experience like applying to medical school since you went like the non-traditional route? Yeah, I don't think it, um, I had a good experience applying to medical school, to be honest. Um, I, I don't know if people know, like there's different types of postbacks. Mm -hmm. um, so I went and did a, a postback for career changers. So I was really just taking the pre-med um, courses, which was really helpful because I had taken them all in one year and then I took the MCAT. So I think it was a little bit easier for me to study, um, but it was a very like compressed process. Like I started the application, I started the program, went all the way through, took the MCAT and then applied like all within a year. It was a very like, it was very stressful. And I think just the application process, to be honest, is probably the most stressful part of all of my, like, I, I'm not kidding. Like the most stressful part of all of med school, because there's so much uncertainty about whether you're going to get in. Like med school is super stressful, residency is stressful, but you're like doing it. You're, you're already there. No, I mean, hopefully no one kicks you out. <laughs> um, it just feels so much better when you're stressed. Whereas when you're applying for, for med school, you're like doing all this stuff and you don't really know what to do and you don't know if it's going to work out. Like you could apply all these places and get zero interviews or you could interview places and not get any offers. Yeah. And it, they take so long getting back to you. Like, I remember being so stressed about the whole application process. So mm -hmm. anyone who's going through that, it's going to work out. I <laughs> take a deep breath. Like, it really is going to work out. But I, it's definitely, in my opinion, probably the most stressful part. Yeah, I always kind of describe that it's like winning the lottery. Because even, like, the people that are most, I guess, qualified and have really competitive stats, you know, you always hear these stories that even they don't get accepted. And then you have... Oh, my gosh. <laughs> And then you have, you know, people that have okay, what people, you know, tip, typically say like under or like lower stats and they'll get accepted. So it's like yeah. it's literally like winning the lottery. Yeah. I mean, so I actually served on the admissions committee for University of Miami. So like what you're saying is so true. Every application I saw was stellar. Like I did not see one application where I was like, why did they even apply? Like they, they all looked really great. 
So in those cases, like how do people decide who goes? And a lot of it is fit. A lot of it is just chance. Like if you had an application that spoke to this group of people that reviewed your application, then they're going to accept you. And if, if unfortunately you don't, then you might not get accepted. So it really, yeah, a lot of luck, a lot of like, um, telling your story in the right way, like trying to stand out a little bit, talking about, you know, the things that make you a little bit different than applicants, as opposed to like all the things that are on the checklist of stuff that you're supposed to have done. Um, but yeah, it's winning a lot of <laughs> Yeah, so you're all the way from Colorado and you ended up in Miami and you've been in Miami since. Was UM your top choice in medical school or like what, what I guess, deciding factor made you go to UM? Yeah, so you decided to go to UM. I mean, I, was, I definitely struggled a little bit about where to go um, from the places that I was accepted because they were all so different from each other. Uh -huh. um, the final decision for me, was related to the type of curriculum that UM has, which is pretty different than a lot of schools. So that made it an easy decision. So UM allows you to do an MD and PH in four years. Normally it takes you, you do the four years of MD and then you add an extra year for your master's. So for me, that was very appealing. The fact that the curriculum was integrated with our public health work, like it really just fit my interest in public health and, and it was like very different than all the other programs. Plus it's Miami, I mean, you have the opportunity to see such crazy pathology, you get to work with a really diverse patient population. So all of those things like really um, vibed with what I was interested in. And then it's Miami, like I, <laughs> I wanted to live on the beach, I'm not gonna lie, I really, <laughs> um, my living in Miami is super fun. So uh, that kind of drew me to, because I never lived on this, this coast before, or this side of the, the country anyway. Yeah. Did you apply directly to the MD MPH program or was it like after the fact that you were admitted to that program? Yeah, no, I applied directly. Um, for people who are interested in applying to UM for that program, you can do both. And I don't think they have a preference. You know, if you if you apply after, they'll consider you still equally as someone who applied initially. Oh, okay. And what was kind of like, I guess if you could briefly say, what was the structure of the program like? How did you manage doing MPH stuff while doing your MD? Because I'm struggling. <laughs> so. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, I just didn't have much of a social life at all. But um, the program has actually changed a little bit, but they, they format it for us, right? Like we came early. So most schools start like August, right? Their first year, mm -hmm. or maybe like late July. We came early um end of june i think so we had like a month of just doing public health stuff we we're required to do stuff our first summer for our public health degree we had extra lectures so um they didn't give us a ton of extra like workload because they knew but they definitely we had extra lectures where they really practice and so i mean it was definitely hard to have the attention span for all that information coming in yeah but I think it helped that they I mean a lot of our didactics and stuff like that also had public health spin so they helped us to apply the knowledge that we were getting like bombarded with in a real life setting and I think you remember it so much better and it's more meaningful when that's the case so they, they did a really good job designing the program. So that's, that was helpful. <laughs> Very cool. And you mentioned, okay, so Miami, I think it's funny that you mentioned Miami because I'm from Miami. Oh, um, I didn't know. <laughs> yeah. What, what part I of Miami? Pretty, I'm part of, I live in Kendall. Oh, okay, cool. Um, I mean, well, now I'm in Tallahassee, but I'm from oh. Miami. But it's funny that you say that because everybody always speaks of Miami like this black sheep, like, you know, we're a third world country <laughs> because people in Miami are just you know we we roll different so. yeah it's, it's like no place I've ever lived before I think I'm gonna miss it because I'm so for my program I decided to do a transitional year that's why I'm in Florida for this year of my residency and then I'll go to Northwestern next year so I'm, I'm definitely gonna miss it I'm gonna miss the weather I, I'm gonna miss the crazy people 100% like the personality of Miami is like nothing else though so. yeah so um, I know you mentioned, I kind of want to touch upon your residency and like how that process works. Like what is the transitional year for? And then, um, yeah, how did you end up like being able to go to two places? 
Yeah. So I didn't learn what this was until third year when I was like starting to think about applying. So, um, and it's still confusing. And so there's certain specialties where you have basically one year of internal medicine that you have to do and then three years of your actual specialty. So it's like radiology, I think um, anesthesia can do it, um, dermatology. So there's like, there's a handful of specialties that do it this way. Um, and PM&R happens to be one of those. So you can choose two routes. You can choose to do a categorical, which is where you do all four years of your residency together. You do that one year of internal medicine and then the three years of your specialty at the same place. They have it like all set up for you. And then you can go the other route of doing either a transitional year or a prelim year for your first year of internal medicine. And then you do the three years at your institution. So that's the route that I took um there's like i guess there's a difference between the transitional year and the preliminary year in the sense that the transitional year was designed for people who are going into these specialties they know that that's where you're going they give you a lot of opportunities to do electives or work in your area of interest um because they know you know you're probably not going into internal medicine um so they try to cater to your um future interests as well as giving you a good foundation of internal medicine the preliminary years are for people like me but also for people who may not have matched into the specialty that they're interested in or they're trying to for example they have like prelims in surgery and prelims in internal medicine they do that year in hopes of getting a full position for the rest of their their residency um, at that institution or another institution so there's like multiple different purposes for the transitional year and preliminary years um, but I elected to do a transitional year because I knew they catered to the fact that I was going into a different specialty later and gave a lot of elective time for us to kind of explore areas and strengthen our, ourselves in areas that might help us in our, our future careers. Okay, awesome. Thank you for explaining that because I had no idea. <laughs> yeah, so it's like categorical all four years together. <laughs> Prelim, transitional year. And like transitional years only for those people who are going into one of those specialties. Unless you want to, I mean, people do crazy stuff, but yeah, that's basically the, the nitty gritty. Okay. And what called you to do PM&R? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I think this is like thinking of a lot of people who are interested in PM&R too, is that first of all, I was drawn to a specialty that was very hands-on. Um, so I, I'm pretty sure I Googled like, what are the most hands-on specialties? <laughs> and obviously surgery is one of them. Um, but I had this very distinct experience in medical school where our school does three years of surgery, or sorry, three months of surgery. That's a lot. And I was, I was loving it. Like I love surgery. It's, I love being in the OR, um, really liked it. And then I went directly from that to doing an outpatient internal medicine rotation. And it was like night and day outpatient internal medicine everyone was so happy they were like you know having coffee together like it was like they were holding hands and skipping down the lane together like they were all just so happy and I didn't realize until that moment that everyone else like in this setting like was kind of low-key miserable and um we were at a, a our program was very it wasn't malignant people it was actually a very positive experience um as far as surgery goes um and so i think that was like a very eye-opening experience for me realizing that the lifestyle is a huge factor and i didn't want to like your peers are a huge impact on you and how happy you are in your career so you know i started researching different specialties that were hands-on but weren't surgery i shouted a bunch of them and all the people that i met in pm and r were super cool i always enjoyed my time there i kept on wanting to go back um and so i think that was kind of what um spurred my interest so just the fact that it's very hands-on and your peers are going to be some of the coolest doctors <laughs> <laughs> not there, to you know to my own horn anything. <laughs> yeah. is there any particular like procedures i guess can you give us a rundown of like the common procedures or patient population that you serve in pmnr yeah. Yeah, so that's the cool thing about human art, in my opinion. So the more I learned about it, the more I realized you can you can do a lot within the field. So 
um, an overrun of everything. PMNR is kind of like a mix of neurology and ortho. That's probably the simplest way to put it. Um, they do a lot of work with people who have like traumatic brain injuries, um, spinal cord injuries, and to, their work is to get them back to being functional in, in society, um, being able to do things for themselves. We do a lot of work as far as like rehab with those patients. With procedures, we do a lot of work with like Botox or different types of injections for pain, for um, spasticity. Um, we do a lot of like ultrasound guided procedures. There's a lot of stuff up and coming as far as non-invasive regenerative procedures that we can do, um, like for tendonitis, for torn partially torn ligaments, they have a lot of new procedures that you can do. Um, if you're interested in doing like probably the most surgery-like um, procedures, they do a lot of spine injections, nerve ablations, they can even do things like kyphoplasties. Um, that's probably like the most invasive procedure that we would do or like most surgical type procedure. But in general, like the type of exams that we do, like we're very hands-on with our patients, very visual, it's a lot of anatomy. Um, so, and it's cool because you get all of that, but you don't ignore or negate all of the medical knowledge that you gain in medical school because you can also do, you know, inpatient um, rehab and you're the primary care for these patients who need acute or long-term rehab. Okay. So, you know, it's like really you have all the options. Like if you're interested in more medicine, you can do that. If you just want to like inject people, you can do that. If you really just want to do like diagnostic procedures, we do like EMGs. Um, so I think there's a lot um, that goes into it. Very cool. What is the lifestyle like? Because I know you said that you kind of were deterred a little bit from surgery because of the lifestyle. How would you describe the lifestyle for PMNR? Yeah, I mean, I would say we still work hard. Uh, <laughs> it's like a stereotype that it's plenty money and relaxation. And I think to a certain extent, that's true in that we don't have like as crazy of hours, mostly because we don't have like these crazy emergent things that are going on. Like most specialties, there's some sort of emergency where you can get called at any time of the day and like oh, you'll have to come in. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunity for you to build uh, schedule where that doesn't happen, but you could also have um, that if you're interested. Um, but for the most part, you know, it's, it's closer to that nine to five <laughs> lifestyle, um, less acuity, so it's a little bit less stressful. And I think the people who go into the field uh, just have like a different perspective on what work life balance means. So even though, you know, they do work really hard, they also prioritize and don't guilt people for wanting to have a life outside of medicine because honestly like that's what I found in so many specialties that and especially in medicine people they'll kind of like shame you for like wanting to do anything other than medicine or like study or like work you know what I mean like I've definitely had that experience where people are like oh you're going on vacation oh wow <laughs> uh, <laughs> why aren't you studying for set like you know what I mean so I think um having that perspective too is is really positive yeah so what was your experience like applying to residency yeah uh, my experience was good I um let's see I'm trying to remember how many programs I applied to I mean I think maybe I applied to like 30 programs maybe 40 programs um, I pretty much just applied places based on location <laughs> and uh, because like PM&R it's a little bit hard to know reputation unless you go to the place or you know someone who went there. So I just applied to places where I thought I would want to live, um, places I'd heard good things about, you know, the institutions that had the big names if I was like interested in, in going to one of the big name places. And that's how I made my list. <laughs> I ended up getting, I can't even remember how many interviews. I think I had, I think I had like 20 interviews, but remember I was applying for two programs at the same time. You have to interview for the TY as well as the main program. So I was like all over the country. I got a lot of interviews um, in the Northeast, uh, in Florida, um, in Chicago, Texas, um, a lot of those like major metropolitan cities because that's kind of the setting I wanted to practice in and, and stay in. 
And then um, the interview trail was really positive. I met a lot of cool people. It's definitely expensive. Um, I mean, one pro to the pandemic is that people don't have to spend like $8,000 on interview season. Mm -hmm. Um, But it was definitely more fun to, I think, to go in person to see the programs. Everyone had a different personality, approached interview day a little bit differently. Um, And you really got to meet like the people who are going to be your peers and you were treated that way. Like on these interviews, they're talking to you, like it'll be your program director. And this might be unique to PMR too. Like we're very chill, laid back, but um, (laughs) they were talking to you as if you're one of their peers. And that was very refreshing and exciting because, you know, you can see like, this is your next step of your career. You're one of their colleagues. Like you are a doctor, you're about to be a doctor. Um, and they're seeing you as such and seeing you as an asset. And so it was a very, very exciting time for so many reasons. So it was a very positive experience. That's awesome. So what has your experience like so far um, as a resident? Yeah, it's been, <laughs> it's been good. Um, I saw, I have a couple mentors and I am actually like this week super burnt out. And I don't know, you know, what it is. I think there's a lot of uh, stressors that you don't anticipate. Like for me personally, it's a lot more of the interpersonal um, working with your colleagues, I guess. Like what is the best way to work with your colleagues, with your superiors, with patients? It's like all the personal side, like the medicine side itself and the workload itself is not what stresses me out actually. Um, there's a lot of other more nuanced things that you kind of, uh, realize that you have some learning and growing to do, which is, that's part of the process. And that's, yeah. that's good. Like the fact that I'm struggling a little bit, I think that's a good sign because that means I'm growing. So, um, and even like looking back, you know, I've been in residency, I guess like four months almost, and I see a huge difference from the first day. Um, Now I can look back and and be like, oh, hey, like I have learned a lot. I feel like much more comfortable. I'm much more efficient. Um, So, you know, you you see those little steps in the right direction and it feels really good, even though, you know, the day to day is is definitely challenging. Yeah. So what was I know you were very involved in uh, medical school. You started at the shop docs. I did want to touch upon that. So Mm -hmm. how did you um, come about starting it? Yeah, so actually, we talked about the reason I went to UM was to do this MPH program. And one of the requirements for the program is to do a capstone project. Okay. And I had just come from Colorado where I had volunteered for this organization that did similar work to what Shop Docs does. And I really missed doing that. And I was like, hey, it would be cool if I could do that here. We basically go to barbershops and do preventative health screenings, health education connect people to local resources so they can get free or low cost care. And we focus on minority men because they have the worst outcomes. I mean, I think a lot more people are aware of the level of health disparity that exists in our country recently because of COVID highlighting that, but it really is in every disease um, that disparity persists. So, you know, I saw some of those similar things happening in Miami and almost in in a more dramatic way because I'm actually in the hospital seeing the worst, the worst. And so, you know, I was just like, why not start it here? That could be my capstone project. I'll just um, start a site here. We'll collect a little bit of data to see if this type of program really reaches the people who don't access healthcare in the traditional way. They don't go to the doctor. They don't go to the health fairs because that's the hard part about medicine. Like you can only help the people that you can reach. So that's where the idea started. You know, I did it all throughout medical school and it kind of picked up some traction because I think a lot of people could relate to the simplicity of it, like going to the barbershop where people are already sitting around waiting. They're already like in the mood to talk, like everyone in the barbershop is just like gossiping, talking whatever about whatever. <laughs> um, so they could like understand how us being there and having these conversations, just introducing this conversation about health into the barbershop setting where it's like families come in, old people come in, young people come in, it's everyone. Mm -hmm. Um, they could relate to that and I think a lot of people got excited we actually ended up growing we have multiple sites now in multiple states so um, it's pretty cool to see how people kind of rally around the idea and see the importance of addressing these health disparities 
That is awesome. And how, just out of curiosity, if somebody wanted to start like a chapter at their school, how do they go about doing that? Yeah, just email us. <laughs> Hello okay. at shopdocs.org. Um, we have an Instagram, the shop docs. Um, you can contact me at my personal. Some people do that. Um, oh, so natural. O-O-H. S-O-N-I-T-U-R-A-L. So I'm also on LinkedIn. I'll, honestly, like if you contact me in any way or the shop docs in any way, we can um, definitely talk about what it would look like. Awesome. I will definitely put your information too in the description box when I upload so people can get connected. Um, so I do want to touch upon kind of like, I guess, the major milestones in medical school. I think a lot of that is like step one and step two. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you were a very strong applicant when it came to residency programs um, <laughs> with all your interviews. So how was the experience with those tests for you? And do you have any? Yeah. Um, well, <laughs> I definitely, so I'll just say like I did not do well on step. So I say that because I really did like at the end of medical school looking because at the end of medical school, our school has like a interview for your letter for your application. Okay. Um, and they kind of run through like, oh, here are the grades that you got here, are your test scores, like all of these things. And they just like lay it all out. And, you know, I was very, I was like very discouraged after that meeting um, because, you know, everyone emphasizes the numbers in medical school like everyone cares about the score everyone cares cares about the test score um step one step two um by any chance sorry is um pass fail for your classes they just changed it i think now they're pass fail yeah all the curriculum has changed at um i cannot really answer very well any questions specifically about the curriculum now going forward um i can talk, speak to like just the general uh, mission of the school but they've changed everything in the past year they're okay. in, in a good way they're doing a lot more um like team-based work a lot more um teach yourself like flip classroom stuff like that so okay um, positive changes but yeah <laughs> now it's i think now it's pass fail okay um but yeah it was it was definitely um a little bit a little bit discouraging but i realized you know the things that were my strengths where the passion that I had for public health was the effort that I was putting into not only school, but balancing all these diverse interests that sometimes I was like, Oh, should I even be focusing on this? Like, maybe I should just like drop it all and only study, um, get like top of my class and, and go into Durham or something. I don't know. Um, I did definitely like struggle along the way knowing if I was focusing and working on the right things, but it felt right. Yeah. And so after that meeting, I was like, wow, I like, I feel really shitty. And then I turned in my application very shortly after and started getting all of these interviews. And I guess I say that to, to, to try to encourage people that, you know, in residency, it really is about fit. It really is about who you are as a person. And I think programs take more time to look at that um, than schools necessarily tell you. <laughs> Obviously they, they tell you the, the importance of the test scores because that's a huge factor. Um, mm -hmm. But I really do think that there's more, people look deeper and especially in Pumanar, they look a lot deeper at who you are as a person, what your passions are, um, what did you do during medical school? And um, some of the things that I did that were outside of the test scores yeah. really helped me to stand out as an applicant and probably make up for the fact that my test scores were were lower. Yeah, did you find that they were at asking you a lot about your involvement when you were interviewing? Yeah, I don't think anyone ever asked about step one or step two. Um, no one asked about my grades. They, I, I mean, I think the most common questions I got were about the shop docs, about um, doing the masters and the MD, like people were like, oh wow, how did you find the time? Kind of like you're asking. Um, yeah. And then they asked a lot about my research because that was one of the things I mentioned earlier, you know, from undergrad on, I was doing research. Um, yeah. So I think it's those things that like are commonalities across your application. People notice that pattern and they'll ask you about it. Like, oh, hey, like I see you volunteered for this organization for like 10 years. Like, well, what's that about? What is it? Um, for me, the interviews were much more about the personality um, and the personal interest than about any sort of, like, what are they going to ask you? Like, oh, why did you get a B in this class? Like, <laughs> there's no point in, you know, having that conversation. Yeah. Really tell them much about you. So. Oh, well, I love to hear that. 
that is very encouraging and a breath of fresh air that I needed today. <laughs> I, I really, that's why I tell it because I was so discouraged and um, I felt, I mean, I was like, oh my gosh, why am I getting, like, I didn't think I would get all of these super competitive interviews I, after that, after that meeting I had, <laughs> I was like, I'm only going to go, I don't know. It, I just want people to know, you know, and it, and I think the programs that match you, you know what I mean? Like the places that you would do the best at are the places that will see those aspects of you as an applicant. Yeah. Um, so. That's awesome. Okay. So that leads me perfectly into my final question. Okay. So kind of reflecting on your whole journey and everything that you said so far, if you could tell yourself, you know, your first year of med school, if you could tell yourself something, um, or if you can offer two golden nuggets to somebody like myself or pre-med that's like, you know, dying to become a physician, but they think the road is so rough, <laughs> what would you tell them? Um, I would tell people to hang on to at least one thing that gives you joy, um, <laughs> because med school kind of like, it can suck the joy for sure um even pre-med it can suck the joy so you know if you play that sport make sure you you know at least a couple times a month are getting out there doing your sport for me like the shop docs was actually one of those things you know that that gave me kind of respite from from the monotony and kind of the more it was like boring studying you know what I mean <laughs> um try to like spice it up a little bit to keep things from getting too um tough um and then I would say like you know it's still time for you to explore and it's okay to not know exactly where your path is going but if something feels right and you're interested in it just like just explore it take a little bit of time I know it's a lot um, and you have a lot of responsibilities already but that's also a responsibility that you have to yourself to explore your interests um, to find out you'll learn something new and, and um, I really encourage you to to continue trying new things, I guess, in medical school and pre-med. Um, don't get too bogged down with the coursework and the check boxes and um, the to-do list. Yeah, and I think you're like a perfect living example of that because, you know, you had a non-traditional route, which I'm always an advocate for. Yeah, and me too, definitely. <laughs> were you a non sorry, were you a non-traditional student? Yeah, I, I took one gap year um, and I did a post back kind of like you said, it was a post back master's program um, just because I didn't have like the highest GPA when I graduated. And so I'm always like, you know, you don't have to go straight in. You don't have to like kill yourself trying to take MCAT while you're doing undergrad, while you're like, you know, joining a sorority or like getting involved, like kind of figure yourself out and enjoy college as it is. And then take everything else a step at a time. Definitely. I a hundred percent agree with that. I tell people to like, <laughs> they're always like, what can I do in my gap year? I'm like, go on vacation. <laughs> like the Euro tour. Like, I mean, now I don't know but during the pandemic. I don't know what people can do, but <laughs> yeah. But there's always like this concern of like, I'm getting old and I'm like, I have, you know, people in my class that are in their 30s and they're doing fine, you know, and they're doing great and they're, it's fine, you know, like what is age at that point, you know? Yeah, I graduated at 30. It was actually like a cool milestone, you know, I'm 30 and I'm a doctor, so <laughs> what's up? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I don't think age matters. I think, I think you should take your time, honestly, like you can always go to medical school. It sounds kind of like counterintuitive, but you can 100% always go. Yeah. Like <laughs> Everybody's on their own path. So it's like, yeah. stop stressing. <laughs> During the interviews, they definitely, I think it was a strength. Like I had so much to talk about. Um, and I've definitely, when I was interviewing people for UM, you could tell the students that were just like went straight through. You could tell, it was very obvious. Um, so I think it's never a bad thing. I think you become more well-rounded. You have more stuff to talk about, um, more examples of how awesome you are because um, you're going to continue doing great things whether you're applying to med school or not, hopefully. Um, so I, I really encourage people to take time off as well. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time and just being overall awesome. Um, I'm always looking at your Instagram and you're very inspiring. <laughs> 
Thank you so much. And well, thank you so much for having me. This is great. And I hope everyone's super inspired, learn something new, and continues to follow your podcast. Thank you. Thank you.